Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Senior Driving, Mobility Matters. I'm Calvin Hu with Family Caregiver Alliance. And before we get started, I'd like to say a few words about our organization. Uh, Family Caregiver Alliance has been working in the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being and quality of life of family caregivers. We offer support by providing a number of services and resources, including consultations, classes, workshops, publications, and we also do advocacy work both locally and nationally. To learn more about Family Caregiver Alliance, please visit us at caregiver.org. Now, your phones and mics are going to be muted, so if you have any questions, you can ask them by using the Q&A box on your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Um, we're also going to be asking for some feedback, so I'd like to thank you all in advance for filling that out, and that'll also be at the end of the webinar. So today I'd like to welcome our guest, Jared Seberg. Jared is the Senior Driver Ombudsman at the California Department of Motor Vehicles. He has over 25 years of experience with the DMV, including frontline work, helping customers, acting as an administrative manager, conducting hearings, and also training employees. Jared was previously a driver safety hearing officer, and in this position, he worked with older adults and made sure that, if at all possible, they could continue to drive in the state of California. As a senior driver ombudsman, Jared X is a kind of go between between the people of California and uh, with a specialty in helping senior drivers. Jared's previous prior experience includes serving in the United States Army and the California National Guard, and he deployed for both operations Noble Eagle one and two while in the California National Guard. So now that you know a little bit more about our guest, I'd like to turn things over to Jared. How's everybody doing this, uh, well, this afternoon on the East Coast, still the morning here on the West Coast? As you said, my name is Jared Seberg, and this is our presentation uh, for senior drivers. Uh, entitled Mobility Matters. Uh, before I get any uh, further into it, uh, we've created this short little video to kind of explain what we do. Hello, the California Department of Motor Vehicles has a unique unit that focuses on the needs and concerns of senior drivers and their families. It's called the Senior Driver Ombudsman and Outreach Unit and it's staffed with dedicated DMV representatives who are committed to helping senior drivers maintain their driving independence. After all, we know that mobility matters. Our team makes sure that senior drivers are treated with dignity, respect, and fairly, consistent with our laws and regulations. We do that by offering outreach seminars for large and small audiences. I'll be providing you with some contact numbers in just a little bit. Our team also assists with individual cases that deal with public safety, sort of a go-between to resolve DMV issues. We want to keep seniors driving for as long as they can do so safely. In fact, research has shown that senior drivers are some of the safest drivers on our roads and highways. California law requires drivers who are 70 years of age or older to renew their driver's license in person when it expires. Here's what you can expect when you visit a DMV office you'll need to take a short 18-question driver knowledge exam, pass a vision examination, and have a new picture taken for your driver's license. You'll have to repeat this process every five years. Again, this is a state law and not a DMV mandate. We know that as we get older, our reflexes slow down, and we may experience issues with our vision. These types of physical changes can put you and other drivers at risk. If you find yourself in this position, you may be asked to come back to our office for a re-examination. Generally, law enforcement, medical professionals, family and friends submit these types of requests. The DMV then investigates to evaluate your level of risk. You also may be asked to provide medical information and take a knowledge exam and a driving test. Now, if your medical condition impacts your mobility, you may be able to apply for a disabled person parking placard. They're available to both drivers and passengers, and they can only be used when the person to whom it's assigned is inside the vehicle. That means it's illegal to lend it to a family member or a friend, use someone else's, or alter a placard or placard identification card. To request a placard, you need to complete an application, which includes a section that requires a licensed medical professional to complete and sign. These placards are honored in all 50 states. Right now, permanent placards 
records are automatically renewed every Oops. two years. Sorry about that. Beginning in June 2023, placard holders will need to submit a renewal notice every six years. A medical certification is not required. Temporary placards are also available and valid up to six months. You can find more information on the DMV website at dmv.ca.gov. Overall, seniors are responsible drivers. They're constantly monitoring their health, assessing their driving abilities, and evaluating when it's time to stop driving. We recommend that seniors discuss this transition with family and friends and develop a plan on how to move around and remain as independent as possible. There are several options you should investigate. You may want to find out if there's a paratransit service in your area. Identify public transportation and rideshare companies. Reach out to senior centers and check if family and friends may be able to offer you a lift. Don't forget that many grocery stores and pharmacies offer delivery service, medications can be ordered by mail, and you can also shop online. Now, if you're concerned about the driving ability of a family member or someone you know, it's very important to approach this issue with compassion. Now, you may feel frustrated and even guilty about depriving someone of their freedom to drive, but remain positive and supportive. Older drivers may think that authorities friends or relatives are out to get them and that's why it's important to be sensitive about how you start this conversation and remember age alone should not be a basis for limiting someone's driving privilege or taking it away you can find more information in the dmv senior guide for safe driving which is available on our website dmv.ca.gov we also offer video tutorials to help you brush up on your driving skills just click the YouTube icon that you find at the bottom of our homepage. Here are some other helpful resources. AARP offers a mature driving program. AAA has a car fit program to help your personal vehicle fit you better. And you may want to check with the CHP about its Drive Smart classes. And as promised earlier, here's how you can contact our DMV Senior Driver Ombudsman and Outreach Unit. If you live in Southern California, call 310-615 in Northern California, the number is 916-657-6464. DME representatives are available to participate in outreach seminars to promote driver safety in California with an emphasis on senior concerns. Did you know by the year 2030, an estimated one in five drivers in the United States will be 65 years or older? Well, that's why the California DMV will continue to work with our seniors to maintain their driving independence for as long as they can do so safely. Okay, so our program. Uh, we were created in 2004 due to overwhelming need. Reexaminations were happening without cause to senior drivers. Basically, and I was, in, I was working in the system at that time, we would get referrals for, please, test this lady's ability because she's short and has silver hair, right? And that's completely inappropriate. We have to have a medical reason to actually refer. So that's the first thing we're here to help and, and, and everything, um, provide information. We can provide any form for any person, regardless of age, anything that you need and clear up confusion. Um, basically we ask us, we ask you to use this as a tool to understand any process that you have questions about. In DMV, DMV is a huge bureaucratic nightmare for some people, well, for most people in California. So, you know, give us a call. And there are additional numbers. When this video was made, we still only had two representatives, Northern and Southern, and I was the Northern California representative. We now have all of our positions filled. So I will have additional numbers for you at the end of this presentation. Uh, this is just a brief slide. Unintentional deaths include motor vehicle collisions. And when it got to when they were saying that seniors are safer drivers, you can absolutely see that uh, because between ages one and 44, unintentional injuries, which include uh, fatal and serious injury car collisions, are the number one reason for death in the United States as of 2018. This is the most current information I can get. Um, NHTSA is a little bit slow on updating these because they have to work with CDC and everything like that. But as you see, when, when we hit 65, it drops down to number seven. 
So overall seniors, especially in California are safer drivers. Um, approximately only 5% of the collisions that occur each year in California are caused by senior drivers. Where the inf information gets a little bit skewed sometimes is the fact that out of these serious injury and fatal collisions, 26% of those involve people over 65, just because our bodies don't handle violent shock the way they used to. Okay. So we understand that aging happens to everyone. Um, I'm, I currently turned 50 this year. When I was 30, I didn't wear glasses. I needed to start wearing glasses when I was 40. And five years ago, I now wear bifocals, right? So my vision has gotten worse over time, but we know it happens to everybody. And the key abilities uh, on oh, factors of driving and strength, dexterity, flex, flexibility, stamina, vision, and complex thinking, all of these change over time. So at some point, you may have to come see us and I'll get a little bit more uh, in depth into that. But even with a loss of limitation of these, we may have to take an action on a driver. We still currently really want to focus on trying to keep your, dri your driving privilege. Um, but losses or limitations, a lot of these um, happen to a lot of people. Our four biggest reasons are dementia or Alzheimer's disease, loss of consciousness or a seizure, stroke and uncontrolled diabetes. But just remember, like I said, we're determined to keep their license if possible. There are actually two specific California vehicle codes that entitle the seniors to us trying to do that. Uh, for reference, their vehicle code section 1674 and 1674.4. Um, and those kind of put together saying that unless we have a legitimate reason, we can't stop the senior from driving, okay? So kind of like in the video, individual choices to consider. Many seniors already do these, uh, already take at these steps as they age, but still go over the choices they have about reducing driving, not driving during peak hours, commute hours, avoiding, avoiding known high traffic situations such as schools and malls, and staying in the areas that they are easily familiar with, not driving at night and not driving on freeway, right? This all caught, you know, reduce driving, stop driving in certain areas, plan around lower volume times. Um, I have a son in high school and I absolutely hate picking him up. I can't wait till he gets his license next year. Um, having a discussion with family members and friends, we ask this to happen at around 50 um, because that's usually the key age when stuff starts happening. And you should have a talk with, their, with your family and friends to ensure that there are alternative methods of getting them to where they need to go on a daily and weekly basis. Um, nowadays, this can include ride sharing app applications, uh, family, friends, paratransit, and other transit, um, uh, other transit methods available. And what we just found out today is if you get in touch with your insurance provider, uh, they may have transportation alternative uh, solutions available to you that are covered by your medical insurance. Um, of course, always attend the approved driving courses in Northern California and most of the United States, because I know I'm talking to a lot of people outside of the state of California. Uh, AARP has the Mature Driver Improvement Program. Um, they have started going back into the classrooms here in California on a very limited basis but it is on their website as well. For California, they charge $30 for it. It's an eight hour course, uh, first time and then four hour refresher every three, two to three years. And it does guarantee a uh, insurance reduction in uh, their insurance. AAA also offers something called CarFit. Uh, this is more along the lines of making sure your car is ergonomically set to you, right? They get in there, they sit you down, they adjust everything and show you how it should look. Uh, California Highway Patrol has uh, a program called Age Well Drive Smart. While not as intensive as the AARP course, it does provide two to three hours of kind of refresher training. And while not guaranteed an insurance reduction, some insurance companies um, do offer an, a reduction for going through the Age Well Drive Smart. Okay. So what is exactly our role? My role in DMV is of course, to assist you and help you clear up confusion, but I'm also part of driver safety, which is part of the legal affairs division, which basically driver safety is post-licensing control for the state of California. 
So our role is to investigate a potential uh, uh, unsafe driver. Um, this can include too many points, driving under the influence, fatal collisions, and physical and mental conditions. We have to determine whether or not a person is, uh, is a risk or safe to drive. Um, we are charged to investigate um, and determine that driver's ability and then determine if restrictions would help or if the person is seen as such a risk to themselves and traffic safety to, to suspend or revoke their driver's, driver's privilege, right? So that's us in a nutshell. So how do we find out about potential physical or other conditions? Uh, we need to find out, we find out these uh, conditions through a plethora of, of, of means. Uh, law enforcement here in California has a specific form that they can fill out uh, when they make a stop or come up to a collision. Um, they start asking questions, you know, do you have any medications? Are you diagnosed with anything? That's standard pr protocol for most uh, police officers in the state of California. So if they start to determine that a medical issue may be underlying the reason why they observed the silly driving or may have caused to the collision, instead of issuing them a citation, they can issue uh, a request for uh, re-examination from law enforcement, right? They have two ways to do that. It's a regular re-examination, which means we can take as much time as we need to to gather our information and make a reasonable determination on what um, needs to happen. The other version of it, if they feel that they're an immediate uh, risk to traffic safety, it's called a priority re-examination. Where us at DMV, we have 10 days to get everything done once you contact us and you have to contact us within five days because they'll hand you a piece of paper with the phone numbers to the local district offices, driver safety district offices on it, and you have to call within five days. If you don't call within five days, we suspend your privilege, right? Medical professionals or the local health jurisdiction. There are a couple um, um, of diagnosed conditions that are mandatory reporters through our local health jurisdictions here in California. That's um, dementia and loss of consciousness. So anytime a doctor, ER, hospital, um, family practice doctor, whatever, if they diagnose you with any form of dementia or any form of loss of consciousness, that goes to the local health jurisdiction. They in turn send us a form saying, hey, this person's been diagnosed with this. Those are mandatory. Other things that come through that sometimes are strokes or other things like a heart attack or an ischemic attack, whatever, you name it. Um, but generally, if it's not received through a confidential morbidity report, if a, and that's the form that the local health jurisdiction sends us, right? Um, a simple letter from the medical practice or company with the company's um, medical practice or company's letterhead in a very basic format, such as I am Dr. Z who is treating patient X for condition Y, I request you to examine their ability to operate a motor vehicle. That's literally all we need from a medical professional to start the examination. Family and friends uh, here in California can fill out a request for re-examination of driver. This has to be completed in full to the best of his ability. At minimum, we need the person's name, date of birth and address to find the person in our driver's license database. If you have their driver's license number, that's even better. Uh, it's set up like any other questionnaire. Top part of it's going on what's going on with them medically. Bottom part of it is what have you observed about their driving that brings concerns to you. There's also a uh, blank piece underneath that that you can continue to provide information. You must put your name and sign it for us. We cannot accept that anonymously, uh, but there is a box on that form uh, to, uh, if you mark it, we will keep your information confidential. Uh, and then you send it to the closest driver safety district branch office uh, located to the person that you're sending it in for. Uh, sometimes through the court system, uh, if they get placed under conservatorship, the courts will send us that information and we have to do a thorough examination as well to determine whether or not they, um, can still operate a motor vehicle safely because the courts have already deemed them incapable of taking themselves if they're under conservatorship, okay? So what do we do when we investigate? Well, the first thing we're gonna do is request medical information, right? That medical information is in the form of a five-page packet. Basically, we need to know about the condition that you're diagnosed with, any medications, uh, and stuff like that. And 
we send this this five page medical out to the to the person. They have 21 days to get it back to us. They can ask for an extension if they can't see the doctor that far. Um, the first page is for the driver to fill out. The last four pages is for the doctor of their choice to fill out. Um, once we get that back, we take a close look at that. And typically we will interview them uh, after that because now that we have the doctor's information, now we want to know the person's side of the story to kind of get an overall view of what's going on with this diagnosed medical condition, whatever it may be. Um, currently, we are not doing in-person investigations because of COVID restrictions. So everything we do right now is over the phone. So it will be contact with the driver safety hearing officer over the phone. Once that's done, um, if you were referred by law enforcement, if you have any form of dementia, or if there's a potential of us catching your license as it expires because of this investigation, we will, or if you're referred by family members or friends, we will ask you to take a written test. The written test has changed a little bit. I know on the video it said a simple 18 question test. We have expanded our tests here in California. So our renewal test is now 25 questions where you're allowed to miss five, okay? So at this point, you take the written test and then based on the condition and based on how the request came to us, law enforcement will always do a drive test. Dementia will always do a drive test. Typically, <clears throat> if you were diagnosed with a stroke, we will ask you to do drive test. If it's a vision condition, we will ask you to do, do a drive test. The reason being we're asking for the drive test is we need to see compensation for something medically that's gone on, right? So with dementia, we need to make sure that you can still operate a motor vehicle, even though you may not be, uh, may not have 100% of your retention of memory and things like that. Um, uh, for the other physical conditions, it's just to show compensation for whatever is going on. Uh, with the drive test, our two biggest reasons why people don't pass the drive test, we don't call it driving too slow, we call it driving too, um, um, da, da, da. can't remember it off the top of my head, sorry. It's been a wacky week already. Um, but basically, if you're driving in a residential area, and we do take you through a residential area in our drive test, or in any area. If you're driving 10 miles an hour under the posted speed limit and there's no reason why the examiner can see that you're doing that, it's an automatic disqualification. 10 miles and under, 10 miles an hour under the posted speed limit is, an, is, is a reason for automatic disqualification. The other reasons that we've come up to is people forget how to change lanes properly. Um, we're testing people that have 40, 50, 60, 70 years of experience <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, too cautious. That's what we call it. We call it. But um, people forget how to change lanes. Uh, they forget to turn on their turn signal, look in the proper mirror, look over the appropriate shoulder, and go when safe to do so. And that's the other thing on our drive test. With the advent of all the technology we have going on today, um, we're not testing the technology. We're testing you. So while your vehicle may have blind spot detectors, may have a, a backup camera, we're asking you not to use those on the drive test because we're testing your capacity to operate a motor vehicle, not the, not the ability for the car to assist you. So those are kind of like no-nos. You don't rely on the blind spot detector. You still need to check over the, the correct shoulder. When you're backing up, you still need to look over, the, look over your right shoulder while you're backing up, stuff like that. Once everything is done, the hearing officer will determine if you're still safe to operate a motor vehicle. Um, we may need to talk about restrictions. And in California, we have a, over 100 restrictions that we can put place on a license. Many of them are like additional right side mirror, no nighttime driving, no freeway driving, um, uh, all the way up from steering wheel knob to full hand controls, stuff like that. There's also a restriction we have here in California called an area drive test or an area restriction. Basically what we do, we take you on a specialized test from your house and you take us to the places you need to go. Places like the grocery store, the doctors, church, wherever you need to go on a daily, weekly basis and it's in your area. If you pass that drive test, we put you in that area. We kind of create a small box. No further to drive north than this, no further south than this, no further east than this or no further west than that. 
or even some in our some of our rural areas that we have here in California only drive on this road because everything is on the same road, right? So you drive from your home, make a left, go down to the main main street in that small town, and you drive down that that street and you have the post office, grocery store, doctor's office, and everything else you need to get to. We've done that too. Now, we also have the option to suspend or revoke, and there is quite a difference between the two of those. If you suspend a person's driver's license and they can reinstate it at some point, if they had a valid license, we can reinstate it and that license becomes valid again. If we revoke here in California, if a person's license is pulled, but at some point they can reestablish that driving privilege, they have to go through the whole process again, written test and, and everything, and start off again with a new five-year license, okay? This is just some basic renewal information here for California. The next slide I'm getting into, Real ID covers actually would cover all of the United States because uh, Real ID is a federal program. But right now, the license is currently to renew $39 to renew for the uh, for five years. Real ID is required by May, 20, May 3rd, 2023. That's our last date that we got from the federal government. Uh, the application is available to fill out online. If you can't fill it out online, we have the application on our uh, touchscreen testing um, terminals in the office. Appointments can be made at, at local DMV offices by using our website or calling our 800 number. And some of the COVID-19 safety procedures are still in place for drive tests, they still are. Uh, we will put a piece of plastic down on the seat. You will be required to keep the windows rolled partially the way down. And we still wear masks for the drive test. Inside the offices, it is now based upon how severe or if they're in outbreak status, whether or not masks are required. Some still actually do test the temperature outside of some of our offices. But that became office, uh, the office manager prerogative about eight months ago, okay? If you have a vision, physical, or mental condition that we know about, we may ask you to renew more frequently. For those that have a vision condition or diagnosed with dementia, almost guaranteed, uh, we will bring you in at one and two year stents at a time, but you only have to pay once every five years. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Real ID, and this is our brief California video to go over the documents needed and steps to getting a federally compliant version of our driver's license or identification card, also known as Real ID. But like I said, the documents and the steps should be similar in all 50 states because this is a federal program, and the things that we're asking you to provide here in California are the same things that other states are asking their residents to provide as well. Whether booking a flight to go see the grandkids or flying to a destination on your bucket list, you'll need a Real ID compliant driver's license or identification card to board flights within the United States starting May 2023. A Real ID has a bear and star. Start your application online. It's not even as complicated as programming your smart TV. Let's help you through the process. If you want to get a real ID so you can use it to board flights within the United States and enter secure federal facilities, the application process is easy. Before you can fill out the real ID application, you'll need to sign in to your DMV account or create one. Once you've completed this process, you're ready to apply for a real ID. You'll need to check the appropriate transaction. If you want a Real ID driver's license or identification card, click ID or driver license. When you get to the Welcome Back page, you'll have the choice to either continue with an unfinished application or you can start a new one by clicking Add next to ID or driver license. You'll then be asked to provide some personal information. When asked what you would like to do today, here are your choices. If you've never had a California driver's license or identification card and you want a real ID, click Get a card for the first time. If you already have a California driver's license or identification card and it's up for renewal and you want to upgrade to a real ID, click Renew a card. If you already have a real ID and you received a renewal notice from the DMV, also choose Renew a card. However, if your driver's license is not up for renewal, but you want to get a real ID, then select correct or update a card. On the next page, choose the type of card you would like to receive. 
Would you like your real ID as an identification card or as a driver's license? The federal government only allows you to have one or the other. You cannot have two real ID cards. You'll then be asked if you plan to use your card to fly. Remember, if you want to continue to use your California driver's license or identification card to fly within the United States, it will need to be Real ID compliant beginning May 2023. Again, you can only have one type of Real ID. Answer yes and fill out the online Real ID application, upload the necessary documents, and schedule an appointment to complete your application at a DMV office. Make sure you bring your original uploaded documents and a photo or printed copy of the entire confirmation page. If you're a AAA member, you may be given the option to complete your application at a local AAA office. So now let's take a look at the application process a little closer. First, you'll need to round up the documents required by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. You'll need an identity document, like a valid U.S. passport or an original or certified birth certificate and it cannot be laminated. If the name you're using today is different than the one that appears on that document, then you'll need to provide documentation to show why you changed your name. Maybe you got married or divorced, you were adopted or entered into a domestic partnership. This is very important. If you've been married several times and changed your name numerous times, then you'll need to provide documentation to show that progression. In other words, you'll need to provide a marriage certificate, then your divorce decree, then the next marriage certificate, and so on. Again, this is a federal requirement. Next, you'll need to provide two documents that prove you're a California resident. You can use things like utility or cell phone bills, bank or mortgage statements. Even your vehicle registration will work. Just make sure they show your name or that your name can be linked to you through the documents you provided. Your residency documents must also show your physical home address. If you use a P.O. box, one of them must show both your physical address and P.O. box. And finally, you'll have to provide your social security number. After you've uploaded your documents, schedule an appointment at your nearest DMV office or select AAA locations if you're a member. And don't forget to bring your documents with you to your appointment so they can be verified. Also, you'll need to show a photo or printed copy of the entire confirmation page that shows two barcodes. If you have more questions or would like to see a complete list of documents you can use to apply for a Real ID, visit realid.dmv.ca.gov. Okay, so that's Real ID, especially for California in a nutshell. Uh, so changes in innovation to, to the DMV. We kind of got drugged kicking and screaming into the 21st century with the advent of COVID. I'm working from home today on a state issued laptop. So most of our services are available online 24 seven. Uh, so these can be paying your registration, changing your address, reporting a sale of a vehicle, renewing your driver's license, requesting a record of your license or registration, transferring a vehicle, filling out the application to start the process of real ID. All of these processes are now available online. So again, the driver's license application can be filled out at home. You go into our website and create your secure account. The written test is offered on a computer at the local office or on our website. Currently right now for our residents 70 and over, we're still under mandate to bypass the written test, but anybody coming into California for the first time uh, or even 18 and older, uh, a California resident, you have the option of taking our written test on at home through our website, www.dmv.ca.gov. And once we reinstitute the written test for those over 70, um, it'll, it'll be available for them as well. It's either a written test or an education component. Many of the documents that we're asking for can be scanned and sent to the DMV from home. But typically, if you have to go into the office, like for Real ID, we ask you to bring those original documents with you because we just need to verify them. We're not gonna keep them. We're gonna verify them and hand them back to you. And then again, we have um, quite a few tutorials and books and all of our books can be found on our website, www.dmv.ca.gov. Okay, again, remember, we can help. 
all of us, all five of us that are out there can help. We can explain the process in simple English, right? Uh, any issue you have about a contact with driver safety regarding your privilege to operate a motor vehicle can be reviewed by us. We will go step by step looking at everything that occurred to the best of our ability, right? We can print and provide you any form you may need if you cannot find it online or have issues with accessing our website. Um, this is modern technology. Our website does go down from time to time. Um, so if you have problems finding a document or if you need to contact us, feel free and don't hesitate. When it is time to stop driving, we have information from several, several government and business partners in our areas that provide low to no cost transportation in your area. Um, I know in Sacramento, I, I've made contact with several different government organizations, uh, such as uh, Agency Area on Aging. Uh, they have a program. Some of the senior centers around here have a low cost program uh, to provide transportation, even if you're not part of the senior housing in that, in that, uh, that area. So again, you know, if it comes to that point to where you're going to give up driving or you've been told by us that you need to stop driving, and it looks like from uh, our point of view that there is a potential risk, we will talk to you and give you information about alternative, uh, alternative methods of transportation in your area to the best of our ability. Okay, these are some of our key partners and what they provide. Of course, AARP provides the Mature Driver and Improvement Courts that is their website and phone number. Then, of course, we have the Automobile Association of America, um, AAA. They provide car fit, and they also have an additional program that they've just started here recently. Um, I think they've picked up uh, AARP's Mature Driver Improvement Course, because I heard them talking about that the other day. So they might be able to offer a version of that as well. Uh, and that is their website and phone number. For those of you that are listening to me that are in California, I do not put CHP's information up here because there are just as many CHP offices in California as there are DMV offices. And the local uh, public information officer is in charge of running the Age Well Drive Smart program because that's part of their grant to provide that and both uh, that and Smart Start to the teenagers. So you would have to get in contact with your local CHP about Age Well Drive Smart and see if they're running the program in your area and, and, and when they are. Okay, brief talk about parking placards for here in California. We, again, we both off, offer temporary, which are our red ones and our permanent blue are available. Um, if you're a first time applicant for a blue or every time you're trying to get a temporary, you must fill out our application completely and it must be signed off by a doctor, okay? Our permanent placards automatically renew every two years, and they are accepted in all 50 states. Our placards, we offer reciprocity with the rest of the states, just like the other states. P parking placards, if they come into our state, we offer reciprocity for them, which basically means if they're valid in your state, they're valid in ours, okay? Um, they automatically, once you're in our system, they automatically renew every two years. But like the video at the very beginning said, beginning next year, we're going to ask our people that are entitled to the handicap placards to self-certify every six years, okay? <clears throat> Proper use of the placard, well, uh, unfortunately, California has a big issue with that. Uh, I talk to investigations every once in a while. They do stings every once in a while. And every time they've done a sting here in California, they've been able to nab anywhere between 100 to 400 placards that have been used incorrectly. And so that's a real, um, thorn in our investigation side because these are some crowded areas such as San Francisco and Los Angeles and while we understand people are entitled to those parking placards having them being misused is a serious issue here in California so it costs that person a bit of money and that's as far as I'll go into that okay this is how you contact us and this is the end of my presentation like I said we have five people available now. We have two in Northern California, we have one in Central California, we have one in the Bay Area, and we have one in Southern California. So at this point, I see five questions in the Q&A and a couple chats, so we'll start looking at the questions. Okay, so to Jean, am I saying that right, Jean? Some people who may be experiencing dementia don't want to get diagnosed, knowing that they may lose their driver's license. How do you address this? Thanks. Well, we don't deal with the diagnosis, unfortunately. None of us have ever become medical professionals. Several of us have, have 
as driver safety managers and driver safety hearing officers, several of us have gone in the law route to become better proficient with the law because that's what we're specialized in. Now, I understand they don't want to get diagnosed with dementia, but in California, if the doctor suspects or we get enough of a determination that it is dementia, they automatically report to us. Just because they have dementia doesn't mean we're necessarily going to take their privilege away right away, unless it's in, in a more progressive state than what we normally see. For the state of California, we have uh, dementia broken down into three states, mild, moderate, and severe. Once a per person reaches moderate stage, um, their privilege, it's time for them to have their privilege stopped because by that definition, a person can no longer take care of themselves and, and needs a person there on a daily basis. Uh, with mild, uh, we allow them to continue to try and, and continue to operate a motor vehicle as long as they can continue to show that it hasn't progressed any further, they can still pass our written test and they can still pass our drive test. As long as they maintain that, we will allow them to keep their privilege. And again, like I said, we will see them much sooner. We usually typically ask a person that's diagnosed with any form of dementia, whether it be the classic Alzheimer's, Lewy body, or anything else like that, we usually ask to see them about once every 12 months. Okay. Uh, I may have missed this. Is, it, is this procedure standard for most states? Are we talking about our program? If you're talking about the senior driver ombudsman and outreach program, no, we are unfortunately unique. California saw a long time ago the need to help address their senior residents because there was a lot of stuff going on that they felt uh, that the seniors felt that were improper uh, going on. Like I said, you know, we used to see referrals, please refer this person because they're old, right? And that's not proper. We have to have a genuine medical condition underlying the poor driving in, a, in order for us to take action. Uh, so we were created and we are to this date still unique. I know a lot of other states. I work on a couple of um, interstate collaborations. Some of them may be not with the, the motor vehicles, but a lot of them sometimes have uh, similar positions inside their transportation, sometimes in, in, inside their, their uh, medical specialties, stuff like that. But for uh, motor vehicles, we are one of the unique ones, okay? Okay, so electronics and safe driving aids in the new car should extend uh, the driving ability of drivers with disability. Why do you not allow the use of such aids during the drive test? Again, because we're testing the person, this is archaic, okay? And I'm, I'm not gonna argue it at all. It's very archaic for um, the department to, to take this stance. But again, we're testing the person's ability to operate a motor vehicle. Car, motor vehicle. While I say you can't use them, the blind spot detectors, if you have them on, are still gonna kick off. We're asking them to demonstrate their ability to drive safely, which means they have to show us that even without all the electronic um, hardware in a vehicle, that they can still do everything that they're required to by vehicle code. <clears throat> are we reviewing that? I'm not sure, I think we are, um, but I can get further information on that along the line. Is it possible for seniors to take all the papers into DMV for real ID instead of doing the whole process online? Absolutely. Uh, we highly recommend that they make an appointment first, but if they gather up all the paper uh, paperwork, whether it be their valid US passport, their birth certificate, marriage certificate, et cetera, the two bills that we need to see, if they have that all filled out, they if they don't have access to a computer, like I said, they can fill the application when they get to the office and they can present that all, we'll scan it and we'll we'll take it. The only reason we're doing a lot of things online is that it eliminates a total of about 15 minutes of your time with us. And how many people like going to DMV, really, in any state, right? <clears throat> but for California, yes, you can take all those documents in, we scan them and everything, and they can do it all there at the office, no problem. Uh, if someone has multiple vehicles and has a disabled parking placard, are they allowed multiple parking placards or only one to be used when driving each vehicle? So here's the deal. So in California, if a person is certified as being disabled, they are entitled to both a placard and a plate. So they can choose whichever one of their vehicles they want to have the plate on it. 
It just has to have their name on the registration. Then they're also issued a placard, which they can use for any other vehicle, including friends vehicles. If they drive with a friend, as long as they're in the vehicle, it's valid to use. So one is assigned to the person, one is assigned to the car of their choice. And so they can basically have two items, a parking plate and a parking placard at any one time. The plate renews just like a normal registration in California once every year. The placard renews every two years automatically. Can you explain what is not allowed when using a blue handicap placard? So um, are we talking, can you clarify that question for me? Are we talking abuse or how, what are we talking about there? Where to park? Okay, so <laughs> good question because basically what it says, right? Okay, so metered parking, especially in San Francisco, unless it's trumped by local parking uh, policy, you know, local jurisdiction, like if, so if San Francisco says, yes, you can park a metered parking for free if you're disabled, but only for a limited time, there you go. You have to follow whatever the local policy or the regulation is in, in the city. But generally, if you pull up to a gas station and you have a placard, there should be somebody there to assist you in fueling if you request. Parking in metered areas generally is allowed and you don't have to pay. Parking, of course, in handicap spots is allowed with the placard. <clears throat> um, green and white zones, uh, those are loading and unloading zones, so not typically there. Absolutely not allowed parking in red. Um, so generally, and I believe that's the question you were asking about, was especially about metered parking. Generally, the rule is, yes, you can park there for free with the handicap placard. However, some local jurisdictions, such as San Francisco, San Jose, and parts of Los Angeles, have changed that to where it's either a limited time or they have provided special places in the same area for disabled parking placard um, parking. So it would actually, you would actually have to look at the jurisdiction to get better clarification. If you use a California driver's license and a US passport for ID, do you still need a real ID come May, 2023? No, so any form, and if you go to the TSA website, they provide you a complete list of acceptable documents to cross um, their checkpoint. Right. The only reason the federal government moved forward with doing this to the driver's license is because that is the most common form of identification a person has. <clears throat> Here in California, we have 39 million driver's license and ID cards issued. Right. So it's the most common form of identification we have. So the federal government wanted to make sure that if you use that to cross their TSA security checkpoints, it was verified by the federal government. But if you have a valid US passport, because remember, this is for domestic travel only, international travel, you still need a passport. So if you have a passport, valid US, if, you have, if you're not quite a citizen yet and you're still in resident status and you have your resident alien card, that's good. Believe it or not, active duty retired military ID cards are good. They have a whole list of items and documents that are acceptable to their website in lieu of real ID. So if you have all of that, you don't necessarily need to get the California driver's license real ID compliant or the driver's license in any other state that you may reside in. Okay. Any other questions from the group? Hi, Jared. Um, we have one in, um, oh, uh, maybe you might wanna answer this next question. I have another one on chat that, um, it's not exactly a question, but I'd like to get uh, your commentary on it. I can read it to you after this next question. Okay, so from Nava, my husband is totally disabled. I drive him around. I drop him off close to the entrance for his convenience. Where can I park after that? I may need to push his wheelchair when we come out. So if he has a placard, guess what? He was a passenger in your vehicle. Absolutely, you can use a disabled parking, uh, parking space. They may question you, but you will have the ID card. You'll have the placard there and you can point at him. He's right over there. I dropped him off over there. So for his convenience, and I'm just parking here but you're still entitled to the parking um, parking placard and the disabled parking space because you are transporting your husband. So yes, you are absolutely entitled to that. Okay, comment uh, on the one you wanted me to go over there, sir? 
Yeah, so it's um, it's in the chat. Um, I'm going to try and probably read it uh, directly as written because it's it's a bit long, but uh, there's not exactly a question, but I just want to see if you had any commentary about it. So this is a listener who has a friend who's been diagnosed with vascular dementia and okay. Alzheimer's. Um, this person's license has been revoked, um, but they continue to drive. Uh, they've been doing so for about a year. Uh, the person uh, in question is apparently in denial of both the diagnosis and also the revoking of their license. This person's family member is trying to figure out a way to stop them, but it's very difficult. Uh, they're, the person's uncooperative, and they're also threatening suicide if they can't drive. Um, and then there's a final commentary that the, they think this person is actually a pretty good driver, but there's their final comment is is that just saying someone can drive doesn't mean they won't drive. So kind of from your side, from the, the driver safety aspect, do you have any kind of commentary or, or thoughts on that? Well, unfortunately, even in this current position, I encounter that a lot. I call them my stubborn, my stubborn cases uh, because you'll get the person highly educated throughout their time. Now they've been diagnosed with a condition that unfortunately still has no cure. Um, and so basically the only thing I can recommend to the family, family member is give them my uh, ultimatum uh, speech, which goes along the line, how do you want your legacy to be remembered, right? You've spent all this time, created all of this security for your family members. Do you want one attorney to take that all away from you? Because if we've done our job here in California, California Department of Motor Vehicles can't be held liable. The doctor's held up his end. Doctor can't be liable. If he goes out there or he or she, okay, if they go out there and they injure somebody or they kill somebody on that roadway, all of a sudden the guns, are gun the guns of the attorney are going to be pointed on him because he's going to do his research. Well, no, his doctor said he couldn't drive anymore. No, DMV said he couldn't drive anymore. We even have record of it. So all of a sudden, everything that you have, everything that you've earned up to this point will be eliminated because your insurance sure as heck won't support you on that because you're driving while your license is suspended. You can't even have insurance right now on the car. If he's driving the car, the car is insured by somebody else. So all of a sudden, the insurance company is going to back off too. And that attorney will have a legitimate complaint and be able to go after him or her for every dollar they have. And they could wind up in, in a homeless situation. I've seen it happen a couple of times, unfortunately, where they refused to listen even to me. All of a sudden they were involved in a serious injury collision and their, their family had no more money because they, they couldn't argue anything that the attorney was going after, right? Medical bills are expensive nowadays and everything like that. So they can give them their ultimatum speech. Um, the ultimatum speech, how do they want to leave their legacy? Uh, the other thing is, is if they have power of attorney, they can legitimately sell the car, but they have to have power of attorney over this person in order to sell the car. Um, maybe if you see him out driving, call law enforcement, say, hey, he's out driving again. Can you stop him and, and, and cite him and, and maybe scare him into realizing he can't drive anymore? Those, those are three of the considerations I would take into consideration. But in order to sell the car out from underneath them, you need to have power of attorney or else there's nothing we can do about it. <clears throat> Just looking, looks like someone mentioned, um, I'm trying to see, see if there's a question, comment with driving, how about with conversations coming from the primary care physician and family caregiver, they're listening, may also help patient. Okay, it sounds like they're, <laughs> they're suggesting maybe, yeah, bring in a, a doctor. Um, to help out. You know, I had one question and it was mentioned in the video and also you've kind of mentioned it and I just wanted to see if you had any advice about, um, you know, maybe starting the conversation early, as early as 50, which a lot of us don't, well, depending on how old you are, it might seem old, it might seem young, but do you have any advice in terms of starting that conversation, um, maybe laying the groundwork so everyone's kind of maybe on the same page and so if well, if this comes up, it's not so difficult? So the thing is, you know, everybody takes this conversation a little bit differently, right? There are some people that have had the conversation with their family members and it's gone pretty, pretty well. Um, there are tools out there. Um, if you look for them, 
uh, I can't remember the name of the publisher, um, but um, they created a book and it's, it, it's, it's, it's actually titled, We Need to Talk, right? And it brings up the, the way to do it and how to start it. <clears throat> remember as an adult child, if you're talking to somebody 50 years old, right? They've been driving for a while. Um, they feel fairly confident and they still, even at 50, because I just turned 50, I still feel mostly invulnerable, right? I know I'm aging. I know my body's changing, but I still feel I can do everything okay. So there's not that big of a concern yet for me, but I've still sat down. I actually initiated the con conversation with my son because he's about to start driving. And I told him to keep in the back of his mind, you know, as we, as I get older, I may start asking you to do more things, or I may need you to do more things, or you may notice you may need to do more things because I can't quite do it anymore. You know, so just keep it, keep an open mind when I start asking you about these things, right? I've also talked to friends that I have across the street and everything like that, but I initiated it as, as the person being 50. But and I can't remember who actually printed it. It was actually a good book that I used to have out there, uh, but they don't print it anymore. But it's basically titled, uh, We Need to Talk. And it goes over how to start the conversation, you know, being gentle, being, you know, understanding and, and getting the groundwork laid. So especially... So especially if you have one family, uh, one parent and they're starting the age and they're starting the show. And if you have multiple family members, who's going to do what? Right. OK, so maybe I'm going to do Monday and Tuesday driving. How about you do Wednesday, Thursday, so on and so forth and break up the driving amongst the family members that are younger and can still operate or maybe talk with friends and say, hey, can you take this part of this day and kind of get that plan set to go that when and if the time comes that the person has to give up that privilege they still don't lose their mobility and their independence because there are people there ready to go for them. Something along that line. Thanks. Um, and it looks like we have time for maybe one or two more questions. We have uh, a question in chat. Um, they wanted to know how long the administrative process lasts if your license has been suspended for medical reasons. And then I guess I want to tack on to that. If say your license is up for a potential review where you have to um, for whatever reason, law enforcement, family or friends, uh, medical, they say, you know, you need to come into the, the DMV. Does, is your license still valid until you make that determination? Okay, so go over the first part of the question again. And I want to thank Jody uh, for putting the link in uh, the Q&A. Thank you, Jody. I was trying to remember who made it. It was such a good book and they stopped printing it. So I couldn't get copies to hand out to people at my presentations anymore. But yes, we need to talk. And it's from the Hartford. They have it there. Uh, so the second part of the question I can answer, until we make a determination, no. Once, you're, once you start the administrative process, unless we have determined that we need to take an action or you become unresponsive to our requests, such as, like I said, when we send out that medical information, we need to have it done within 24 days of mailing. So it's 21 days from the date that we send it out, right? Because we allow for three days for mailing. So if you don't respond to us by that 22nd day or that 25th day by mailing, we're suspending your privilege. If you have a priority re-examination and you don't respond within that five days, we're suspending your privilege. Everything else, as long as you get the information to us in time, as long as we're only doing the investigative part of it, we haven't taken an action, the privilege remains current and active until we decide if any action needs to happen. Now, as far as the actual action itself happening for physical and mental conditions, it's for the state of California, it's called what is a discretionary action. Even though we've proposed the action, you still have the right to a hearing on that action, which means you can challenge our decision. And even after that, even if we uphold the decision after that, even after that, if you bring us in new medical information, we'll reopen the case and re-examine it and take a closer look at it. So, for us, these discretionary actions are open-ended until we get new information that says to the contrary to what we have, and we can look at it again and give the person another opportunity. Now, with a couple of the cases, they're cut and dry. Like when I said, we get to the point to where the doctors are telling us that 
the dementia is moderate or severe. That's pretty clear cut for us. That's pretty cut and dry. Unless you can get us a really good second opinion and saying you're not at moderate stage or severe stage, we won't ever reopen that one, right? Because that's at, that's at the point where they are considered a danger to themselves and to others on the roadway. But for everything else, it's generally open-ended. And if you can get us new information, even after we take the action, we will reopen it and take a look at it. Sometimes it's just not you passing our behind the wheel drive test. That's very simple. Just ask for a new drive test. We'll reopen it. So how long do they last? It varies because like I said, they're open-ended. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. I think we are just uh, about out of time. So um, I'd like to put up a quick survey and then we'll close out today. So again, thank you everyone for joining us today. These um, Family Caregiver Alliance webinars are free. We um, continue them, they happen every month. You can find out about the next webinar on our website, um, caregiver.org. And then also someone had asked, uh, I'd already answered the question, but um, we do record these. So this will be up on our YouTube channel, which is caregiver.org, all spelled out. So um, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us and especially to great thanks to our guest, Jared. Thank you for joining us today. Anytime, sir. So this is, um, that's the end for this one. Um, looks like we're getting uh, into the holiday season. So I hope uh, everyone's um, making plans and working out how they're going to um, you know, manage with relatives coming in and all the holiday responsibilities. But um, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Our uh, contact information is up on the slide. Um, thanks again and um, th take care. And I'll leave the line open a little bit so you can um, fill out this evaluation. And again, we'd all appreciate if you could um, give us your opinion. Thank you so much. And again, thanks, Jared.